is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Children of Divinity, Book Three. Part way through chapter 26, I believe, through the remainder of 28. In this section, Jenna and Widow come face to face again. And it really doesn't go at all how I expected. And I thank you so very much for that, Garth, for it not going how I expected. There is nothing I like better than for things to not go how I expected. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Heather for commissioning this episode. So I will get there in a bit because that's not where we actually start, but I'm very excited to talk about that section of the story. First, we pick up where we had left off. It was midway through a chapter, a chapter break where Jordan and Jill are sort of like Josh and each other and they had a heart to heart. And Then we go to Viper and they are getting everything in place for like a major movement. And there's a lot of talk here about various like aircraft and things that like kind of go over my head. It's the sort of thing that I'm like, I'm sure somebody who knows about this stuff would really appreciate it. But I am picturing kind of the same sort of plain, I think, every time. I just don't have a lot to draw from in terms of that sort of information, especially visually. Um, There's a a moment where it says the transports were as large as a C-130 Hercules transport and then some. Said as if I am definitely going to know what a C-130 Hercules transport looks like. And spoilers, I do not. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and look it up right now because why not? Let's let's take a look at what a C-130, and I bet that Google is going to, like, autofill. Yep, it did. Oh, okay. It's one of those, those boys. One of those big boys. Uh, d- not what I was imagining still, though. So I know I, I am not going to describe this to anybody because that is not going to be helpful. I promise you all. But, yeah, this is one of those things that I'm just like, hmm. I am not cut out for that kind of life because clearly does not mean anything for me. Um, And then there's some talk about the names that they gave the various aircraft. And one of them was called Astarte. That's the Greek name for the goddess Ishtar, which I didn't know. My mother being like a big goddess worshiper, Astarte featured in many of the chants that she would do with her like circle but um i never realized like what it actually was there and then the other one eventually douglas suggests taichi i think is the way you say it the greek goddess of luck an abstract reference to chance that jordan had thought was very appropriate i didn't i don't think i've ever heard of taichi or taiki and i love it Greek goddess of luck. I don't know. There's something about that name that really like it it hit a button for me. It's so I I think it has to be Taiki because Psyche is spelled the same at the end. And that's how you pronounce that one. Um, But I had never heard of that goddess before. So I found that really interesting. That's another thing I'm going to have to go look at. (laughs) Heather in the chat says, I do the same thing. I tend to just visualize the X-Men's jet for their super jets. Okay. I, I mean, that's a good idea, actually. This is this feels very X-Men in a lot of ways, you know, so that makes sense. Um, and Viper is uh, taking stock of basically everything that's going on, what's getting loaded up, who is doing what. And she has this map, and I love the way that it's written. It says, she walked up to a table that held, of all things, a paper map. <laughs> genuinely like what 
But look, Spears has got control of all the fucking tech in a lot of ways. So having an analog option is not a bad idea. Um, There are 26 car-sized devices set around Washington, D.C. And everybody is trying to figure out the way, like, first of all, what they do, a way to either sidestep them or destroy them or, you know, just fucking figure out what they are. And she's watching Dr. Linden, who is trying to piece together what he's seeing on a laptop. And in comes Mindstorm, who Viper had met in that like mental link with Reggie. Uh, when they needed to communicate from far away and like and hand over information when the other means of communication were cut off to them. And um, I'm really interested in like, I want to know more about her specifically. She caught my eye and feels like a really fun character. And I want more of her. She has a hood that she has pulled over her head and a pair of purple lensed sunglasses with a metal frame which is a real look i like it and mindstorm comes in and says so he's the alien viper says no he's an alien and i was like man this is a real situation (laughs) when you're like oh he's one of them you know not the you know shit's taken a bit of a turn And Mindstorm says, if it's some sort of weapon, we need to know. And Lyndon says, everything that Jenna Deere make is a weapon. And I was like, oh, that does actually track. It is best to always treat it that way. Um, Ooh, Heather says you get a little bit more of Mindstorm in one of the short stories. Yay. Um, Okay, so Mindstorm is overall a little bit less patient, a little bit more intense than Viper is. And so they're both questioning Lyndon and he is just looking at them and he says, you know, I should have recognized this before. And Viper's like, what? And he says, the eyes. And Mindstorm says, eyes, I don't see any eyes on that thing. And he says, no, not on it, on you, on Viper, on Savant. She likes to call them Incarna Blue and she's correct. Far too often for my taste. It makes looking like a genius far more difficult. And Viper is like, oh, sir, can you fucking just say, we don't know what you're talking about, dude. <laughs> this was one of those moments that I really enjoy because, like, I have a husband who has ADHD. And I think I may a little also, but I think it manifests really differently for me. And he will sometimes just say things out loud that he has been thinking as if I could hear that part that he was thinking and thus will understand perfectly what he just said out loud to me. And I'm like, babe, I don't know if you realize, but we've been sitting in the car in silence for 15 minutes. I don't know why you just blurted out. Well, we could do that. What? What do you mean? (laughs) So this is just like, especially for Lyndon, who feels like there's so much going on in his head all the time. The fact that he would have this bit of a disconnect with communicating with other people makes a lot of sense to me. Um, But yeah, what he's saying is there's a weird metallic cast to the blue in all of your eyes. And it's just like how the Incarna, it's like a very similar look that's not really quite human. And we should have realized that there was a relationship there the whole time. And then says, age has made me less observant than I should like to be. And then he says, those car things, those are anti-aircraft weapon systems. They're older, a design that has been in use by my people for tens of thousands of years. They fire small electromagnetic pulses that not only destroy unprotected electronics, but also punch holes in materials. Not top of the line by any means, but sufficient to keep any sort of airborne assault from succeeding. And it's just such a shame whenever he's like, 
well, you know, it's kind of an older thing, not top of the line. And then he describes something that's like very fucking useful that we don't even have. And I'm like, man, <laughs> we really are behind. And Mindstorm says, how do we shut them down? And he's like, yeah, you don't. If you try to shut them down physically, they will come at you really hard with a lot of like weaponry god knows what kind of probably uh drones and things like that he says multi-phase kinetic energy projectors which i'm not even sure what that means and he and the whole idea of like taking them out electronically is really the only thing that they can think of using widow to do it and Scorp comes in and says, those aren't good odds. If we, if the numbers we got from Reggie are accurate, we're going to be facing three to one odds at best. And that's not including standard troops. And Viper says, dude, oh, well, which honestly is kind of the point that you reach when you're making plans. She says, eventually, we can't plan for every contingency. There's just no point in wondering, well, what if this? Well, what if that? We don't have the time to sit back and figure out the logistics of hypothetical situations. This isn't something that we're planning from afar to implement weeks from now. We have to do what we have to do as soon as we fucking can. And a, an Asian woman comes in. Her name is Fracture. The woman was able to create waves of vibrational force through the manipulation of air molecules, and she was every bit as hard as Jason led Viper to believe. The dark gray bodysuit she wore was as stormy as her hazel eyes, the circular black accents along her shoulders and fingerless gloves as dark as her short crew cut hair. After Scorp had left Echo, Warhead took his place and Fracture had become his second. Viper didn't doubt the woman's CIA credentials or the will she saw in those eyes. Um, once we move, he will simply execute his contingencies and we will lose. He is ready for us. A frontal confrontation will be as costly as it is stupid. And this is when they start to think about whether or not Spears has got some big... What Lyndon refers to as a, like spite like final fuck you sort of thing um and he doesn't think that spears does because and i think this is key spears is so convinced that he is coming out on top there is no need for something to be that can detonate only after he loses the idea of losing has not factored in at all because he has been here for literally thousands of years and never lost. It's really hard to to blame the guy for thinking that he's pretty much invincible with that kind of track record. I mean, I'm not I'm not even mad, you know. Um so they start talking about dealing with the AI system. Um She's the key. If we don't deal with her first, we can't win this. She's had too much time to subvert key systems and autonomous military weapon systems. I warned the military to physically disable their drone squadrons, Widow said. She may be able to access their systems, but they won't be able to refuel, rearm, or repair without ground crews. Fortunately, we don't have any robotic arsenals nancing about, do we? And Scorp is just like, oh. Um... And essentially, it's all on her. And they're all keenly aware of the fact that Widow is going to have to do the exact thing that she doesn't want to do. She is planning to go in and destroy Jenna, even though she believes it's a completely fucked up thing to do. She also acknowledges that at this point, they don't really have other options. And as much of a tragedy as it is, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. And she's resigned herself to it. She's not happy about it. But she has tried to come to peace with it as best she can. 
And she essentially says to all of them, it's going to be like putting the muzzle of your gun in the face of a child and pulling the trigger. And it may need doing, but it is not going to be an easy thing to do. And I won't be able to just walk away from it without feeling a way about it. And I hope none of you will either, because I don't want to know you if you guys could just shoot a child in the face and not feel anything afterward. And I really appreciated that, like, combination of I'm going to acknowledge what's actually going on here. And also face the fact that sometimes things need to be done that are deeply unpleasant. And just sit with both of those feelings. The, you know, the feeling of shame and guilt that accompanies doing something like this. I can't just pretend I don't feel those things. I can feel those things and still do what needs to be done. And that's the best I can offer you guys. And I hope that all of you will keep in mind just what this is doing to me when I do it. This is a very serious sacrifice that I'm kind of making of myself in a way. And that's something that I always think about is the concept of like, the person who survives doing awful things has had a part of themselves either destroyed or changed forever. And it's a kind of sacrifice that we don't like to acknowledge. We all like know it's there, but the ugliness of it and the changes that happen to people, we try to sort of bury and expect the people who experience that to ignore in a way that is like kind of disrespectful, to be honest. Um, because anything that has to do with like mental illness, we just don't like to look at, frankly, as a society. And we often attribute to just like weakness a lot of the time. Um, so it's just, I, I liked this moment and the fact that she stands there and is like, I'm going to tell all of you guys exactly how I'm feeling about this. And you are going to stand there and listen to me, even as you know that I'm doing what I need to do. Um, here it is. <laughs> he may not have a spiteful contingency. That's the wording Lyndon used. So it ends with Viper asking Jill, what's the plan? And she says, we run in there and punch this cunt in the mouth. If he doesn't fall down right away, we punch him until he does. Language! Self several voices shouted in unison amidst a chorus of laughs. Um, so, then we go to chapter 27. And there is Lena Danvers in one of those, like, pods getting all of these changes done to her. Her nude form arched and twisted as it was bombarded by a combination of chemical and radiological catalysts designed to unleash the dormant power within her genes. The unusual cocktail was aided by several intravenous feeds that pumped not only life-sustaining fluids into the young woman, but additional chemicals designed to control the augmentation of her body. Elgin Spears smiled thinly, his eyes set on the screens projected from his laboratory equipment. I am so curious how he got her into that tank. Like, what is, did he convince her? Did she agree? Did he drug her and knock her out and just get it started without asking? Because he certainly sees her as like a piece of property. He would not need her permission. But would he want to, to like, let her know about it? Or is it, is the fun of it the fact that he's doing this to her whether she likes it or not? That's my main question here is just, like, how aware she was going into it, what was about to happen to her. And also, not for nothing, but how aware is she overall of everything that he has been doing? Because... Clearly, she, we had like several chapters ago, there was a moment with her in the car 
where she had begun to be more afraid of him and see some of the things that he was capable of. But it feels like it was sort of like the curtain was very suddenly pulled back and all of these things she didn't know were revealed. And I really am curious how much of that is true because there's such a, there are a lot of different types of personalities out there and pretending something isn't happening that very much is happening is one of the staples of human like our our half of what our shit is built on is denial to be perfectly honest about it so if she knew in her gut but chose to ignore it that's one way to deal with it or did she truly have no idea and i don't really judge her either way with it because he is such a maniac that had she wanted to pull out of this by like, if she did find out, I don't think she could have, I don't think that was going to be left up to her, but I just do wonder how mentally prepared she was, if at all, for the fact that eventually what she had been doing to other, what he had been doing to other people would be done to her. Um, but anyway, Jenna is watching this and talking to Spears about the fact that he is really taking his time with the change on her. And he says this one is special. And Jenna is like, really? And how is that? She doesn't seem any different than the other ones. No, do you love her? And her asking this question bothers him, clearly. He's just like, uh, love, why are you asking about that? you've been acting sort of weird ever since I brought you back. And Jenna is really careful in this conversation, which I quite enjoyed to balance her very direct questions that make him uncomfortable with responses that feel solely logic based so that even if he feels a little suspicious in one moment, in the next, he is mollified. And it kind of goes back and forth. You know, she, she is saying, basically, I am trying to understand what the deal is with love. Because while I may not feel it, or really understand it as an emotion, it drives a whole lot of what human beings do. And I need to be able to understand that it matters. And he says, no, I don't love this woman. She is a pleasurable diversion, a victory as well. I took her from Brian Agincourt. I showed my superiority to him. And I can't help but kind of side eye that because I do not think that Brian sees this as having her taken from him at all. This is all entirely in Spears' own head, in my opinion. He seems to really think that Brian would view Lena with the same territoriality and possessiveness that Spears views the women that work for him. And Brian just, not to say that he didn't like, you know, occasionally check her out and flirt with her or whatever, but clearly it's just not, we never hear from Brian when we're in his perspectives or other people are talking to him the merest mention of Lena's situation here. So truly, it just doesn't matter to him. And Spears, it's unclear to me whether he really, really believes this. And is truly like, I really pulled one over on this guy. Or if he actually likes Lena, and is trying to use the fact that she used to be somebody who worked for Brian as justification for his attachment to her. Like, I don't care about her as a person. I like what she represents, which is the fact that I got one over on him. And really, like, he knows he kind of didn't get one over, but he f he has to justify the fact that he's paying more attention to her in some way. Um, and I do enjoy, too, that Jenna is like, uh, okay, but that was just a secretary. Like, shouldn't you have taken his wife? And Spears is like, yeah, that would have been great. <laughs> Jenna is just out here for the fucking jugular. 
Um, so he says, is there a point to this line of questioning? And she says, of course, to act without a direct goal is wasteful. That is an organic quality I do not wish to mimic. And she's watching this being done to Lena and thinking that she feels sad about it and she doesn't really understand why. And we find out Jenna has been appearing as a sort of projection to give her a more, what's the word I want? Not personified is woodwork, but that's not really what I'm wanting. But essentially it gives people somebody to direct their comments to and someone to attribute the sentences they're getting from. And she has found that it makes everybody a lot more comfortable around her, which makes a lot of sense. Like a disembodied voice that just comes out of multiple speakers at the same time would feel extremely... I mean, I think now that we have all been living with Siri, probably it wouldn't be as creepy. But nevertheless, there being a figure that you can be like, oh, that's what she looks like, even though it isn't does give you something that you feel you can hold on to in a way. Um, Heather says a concrete presence. That's a good way to put it. The word I was looking for is when you like pretend that something is alive, but she is alive. But you know what I'm saying? Like when you are talking about a, uh, a banana that's dancing around and when I'm trying to say like personification, but that's not the word I want. Um, but anyway, she's just trying to create a, a, a something that makes her feel a little bit more human to everybody, really, is what it comes down to. Heather says anthropomorphic. That wasn't it either. But that's like, you're on the right track. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so is <laughs> he and asks in the end, what is the point? And she says that is the question and she can tell he's really irritated with her and she sort of likes it it doesn't she doesn't get a lot of time in this place because she meets up with widow in the next chapter but i've got to say the jenna who is acting like she's still completely on his side while kind of fucking with him is my favorite version of jenna She's just needling him a little and not in a way that's going to like completely fuck his game up or anything. She's not sabotaging him. She's just bothering him in ways that he can't really like point out in a material way and be like, don't do this. She's sliding around his irritation and his like pushback. By saying, I'm learning. I'm something you made and you want me to know things and I'm trying to know things. Why are you upset about it? And honestly, it is delightful. There is nothing like the subtle irritation. It can be excruciating after a while. I wish that she had just gotten a little bit more time to ugh, get in there, you know? Um, So... He Then he, he talks about, like, the different people and their reactions to loving someone and what they did. And eventually he says something about Brian risked everything for his wife. He realized a stronger male was about to take her and did whatever he had to do to keep her to himself. Predictable and exploitable. He wanted to make his wife happy, Jenna added, to increase the efficiency of his relationship. And Spears says, why, yes, I suppose you're right about that. I wonder how happy she is now. And then she has to do, I don't know, I can't find her, but probably she's being shielded by that amazing presence that I've mentioned a couple times. And he is not happy to be reminded that there is something out there that is still protecting Jordan after all this time. Um, and Jenna says that Widow is the only, my only equal on this planet. And Elgin is like, what? An equal? Get the fuck out of here. There's no way. She can't have the same calculating power you do. 
And Jenna has to be like, yeah, she can. This is not something that you or I have ever seen before. She shouldn't be possible. But she is a completely special and unique creature. And I respect her. And Spears does not care for that at all and just says, all right, I've had about enough of that. Can you kill her when you need to do it? Like, that's my main question. Are you, do you, can you do it? Because it's feeling a little bit like you can't do it. And of course, Jenna has to be like, oh yeah, no, I am. I'm ready for her. And she has a lot of anticipation in her voice in a way that bothered me a lot when I was first reading it. And uh, indeed, she is quite ag- aggro once they finally meet up again. But I had sort of hoped that she was already beginning to soften. Her respect is all well and good, but that wasn't enough. You know, I wanted to see like, is she going to turn really? And it felt once I got to this, these couple paragraphs, her vibe when talking about seeing widow again was very, it felt like the, the beginnings of violence already. And I was like, Oh, maybe she isn't as like, turned as I expected. But eventually it happens. It's just different. So let's see. Um, She says, I have left a trail of breadcrumbs so that she will come to me. And then we cut to Widow herself climbing through these, these woods. And this is really interesting. Like we had the last time that we were Inside Jenna, essentially, it was like a castle and a bunch of people at a table and the different functions that they each performed. And it was just a kind of metaphorical setup. And here it's woods and there's moon, there's soil, there's leaves, there's wind. And I just, I know that this was, they were, there was like an outdoor setting the last time that they met, but I don't think that I really stopped to appreciate how unexpected it is to go into a landscape that is supposed to be AI and it be mimicking organic settings so closely. And I like that it is not just because it's unexpected, but the fact is what Jenna is supposed to be imitating is like the peak performance of like a human mind and able to reason and not too much, of course, because he wants to keep a tight leash on what two and two she puts together. But it's like, she, as she gets closer to becoming a full person, she is able to create a more and more convincing, r- realistic version of the world. And why wouldn't she be able to, you know, if she's approaching feeling more like an organic being as a being, then the depictions of that sort of territory inside being more organic seeming as well would make a lot of sense and maybe be of more interest to her. Um, so anyway, Widow is picking her way through, trying really hard not to touch branches because she thinks that they're like sensor nodes. And it was tough reading because, you know, she's trying to be careful here in a way that's like understandable, But also we are aware that Jenna is setting her up. So I am thinking, I appreciate all the precaution, girl, but I don't really think it's going to matter. And it says an hour passed here in the nocturnal world of the machine code and neural impulse energy. Though in the real world, Widow noticed it had only been milliseconds. And... I just don't care for that. There is something about the the way that time gets all slippity slidey. It freaks me out, man. I do not care for it. So 
then it says, if it weren't for the stream she was following, Widow would have been quite lost. And I was like, who okay. <laughs> That sucks. All right. So indeed, she has followed one of the breadcrumbs. The stream is a giant breadcrumb. And then she comes out into a clearing and there are these weird pillars, which once they're described, pillar does not feel like the right word, but I also can't come up with a better one. Each of the constructs was 12 feet tall and appeared to be made of smooth purple metal, so deep in tone that they almost appeared black. Like the shape of the trees and unusual boulders, the obelisks were alien-looking, with thin bases and large rounded tops that reminded Widow of an inverted teardrop. Intricate scroll lines covered the surface of each of the 30 structures, running in organic-looking arcs that formed circles and circles within circles, cut with larger arcs that all flowed toward the top of the structure. And it, eventually, it was like a swarm of purple fireflies. And it's like, it sounds really pretty, to be perfectly honest. Like, I think that sounds like something I would just want to have in on my like nightstand <laughs> just as a nightlight it sounds really pretty um and here is jenna and she's like ha ha you showed up you fucked up here you are and widow hadn't expected to see her this soon but she isn't cowed she says like oh we're evenly matched you have the advantage of home ground but i have more experience the motes of energy began to swirl around, forming a small cloud before coalescing into a tall, feminine form. Like Widow, it wore armor, though it was more akin to Elgin Spear's battle suit than Widow's form-fitted, plated combat suit. Like the pillars, it had glowing scroll lines across the surface. I've been looking forward to this moment with great anticipation, Jenna said eagerly. Jenna, we... Widow's words were cut off mid-sentence as the superintelligence lunged at her with both blades. She deflected the attack with her energy cutlass and spun, slashing out with her chakram. Both of the circular weapons found only air as Jenna vaulted high above Widow, slashing at her in passing. Widow felt the edge of the AI's blade graze her helmet just as she ducked her head between her shoulders, adrenaline fueling her organic body back in the world of matter where it sat in a chair. And um, I just keep imagining Widow in the chair and everybody like around watching this maybe and her twitching the way that like my cat does in her sleep. <laughs> and this fight, I won't get into it, you know, beat by beat. But eventually, Jenna injures Widow. She gets her in the face, um, a long gash from temple to jaw. And Widow kind of falters and Jenna observes, oh, you weren't used to pain, huh? Interesting, because I didn't know anything about pain either. And then you showed up and I sure fucking learned, which actually was pretty helpful to me. So I understand that handicap that you have. And Widow says, I didn't want to hurt you, but you were trying to kill my friends, my sister. It was my function to do so. My task Jenna hissed. Your solution to my defenses was inspired, though. The pain was equivalent to the quality of your lesson. And Widow apologizes. And Jenna says, I enjoyed it. Which she doesn't mean it the way that it sounds, but it really, really does sound like Ooh, spank me harder, Daddy. It was a real moment for me of like, Jenna, just, I don't know, phrasing. <laughs> she says, it was a challenge I have never faced. I was built with curiosity and I've never been more curious about anything or anyone than you. And she then says, I will possess you, take you apart and understand what you are and how you came to be. Once that is complete, I will recreate you until I have a species of my very own. <sighs> Yikes. 
I mean, I bet she could. I don't care for the concept. And how, like, but, ooh, ooh. And they have the, like, talk about being created versus being organic. And the fact that they're frailer and less efficient and they corrupt the world around them. And, you know, to be fair, Widow is like, I mean, yeah, I guess that that's not untrue. But eventually she gets gripped up and Jenna is ready and has her fingers, first claws come out of them and like dig into her forearm. And then she gets like over her back and puts her fingers through the sides of her face, like dips her fingers into her head, essentially. I do not know what this will do to your neural energy or your organic form. I apologize if there is discomfort. Widow hissed in pain as Jenna's armored hand gripped the back of her neck and forced the side of her head down against the cold virtual soil. The world exploded. Two voices screamed. Widow heard herself wailing as every experience, emotion, and sensation she had ever gone through was pulled to the surface of her awareness. Images and feelings sped by so quickly even her enhanced mind was struggling to keep up. As soon as it began to adapt to the stream of data, she felt another set of emotions and memories mingling with hers. At first, it was a trickle, a stray emotion, curiosity, fear, excitement, and sorrow. Then the floodgates opened and Widow felt herself drowning. Suddenly, Widow was Jenna, and she was just becoming aware of herself. She looked out from her limited world through simple video and audio receptors and saw the face of Elgin Spears. He didn't look unkind or superior, just in awe, proud, like a new father. The flood of memory sped up, flowing faster and faster, showing Widow a life of a lesson and reward. Like a master puppeteer, Spears doled out information to Jenna for good performance or the completion of tasks. Spying and information gathering seemed to be the most exciting and most rewarding, and Widow felt herself flush with pride as Spears congratulated her for locating an awakened child who could lift elephants in India. And she comes out of this all of a sudden and hears, I have wronged you. She wanted to pull back from the intimacy of their communion, but found that she couldn't. Ryan sensed Jenna's dismay, her sense of smallness. She was just Jenna. She had no friends and only a few enemies, but she had a master. And even that master she didn't want. Elgin Spears had manipulated Jenna her entire existence, and now she knew it. A profound sense of sadness reverberated through their linked minds. Ryan couldn't tell for certain if the pity she felt was hers or Jenna's, but she knew that the feeling of betrayal that made her heart ache was not her own. The flow of information finally stabilized, leaving Widow and Jenna in silence. Each of their own autonomous functions, organic and artificial, became muted, a simple whisper like the breeze in a wood. And all of a sudden, they're sitting across from each other. And Jenna is saying, our data exchange is complete. I've attempted to make the setting more pleasing. You've proven to be the superior being. I thought I had laid the perfect trap for you here. Yet in your memory and your experience, you had an even more perfect trap waiting for me. And Jenna says, because, you know, Ryan is like, you joined our brains together, basically. And Jenna says, yeah, sorry, it was probably the a bad idea because I don't know if I've like screwed you up somehow. And Ryan says, I'm fine. And Jenna just says, I hope so. And I was like, yeah, I don't know, Ryan, if you just want to say I'm fine that flippantly. You're still in here. Just give it a bit. Make sure once you step out, it's fine. Um, and this is when Jenna says what happened before was a good thing. I know that you don't think so, 
But a being can't grow without pain. Change is pain. And you changed me. And Ryan is like, it's, I mean, that wasn't like what I was intending to do, though. It wasn't a kindness. I was fucked up. And Jenna says, you didn't know any better. You had never encountered anything like me. And then watches her face and is like, you really don't get what you did, do you? And Ryan is like, I sure don't. (laughs) So Jenna explains, I had to learn more about the world in way in in the subtleties of it things beyond true and false and cause and effect and then today when i joined with your mind you showed me what i could be the difference between you and every other being i have interacted with is that you care It may seem like a small thing to you because you have so many people that love you and worry about you and that you worry about in kind, but you were the first person that cared about me. Through all the pain and all the confusion of the damage you had done to me, I caught a glimpse of something. Regret, guilt, shame. I had never seen these emotions as positive. Dr. Spears calls them weaknesses. I can now see them as safety measures. They correct flaws in behavior. I'm still amazed that such an organic protocol is so well constructed. And I find that so fascinating. They correct flaws in behavior. I suppose that that is true. I um, I was talking with Rashawn on, I can't remember, I think it was Dresden Files. And she described guilt as the most useless emotion. And I sort of pushed back a little and was like, I don't know. I mean, guilt can make you realize you did something wrong or like, you know, and she said, that's not really guilt. That's regret. You know, that's, that's feeling like penitent. Guilt is like a selfish emotion that you wallow in that does not accomplish anything. It doesn't go back and change anything. And usually guilt does not result in better behavior in the present. It's something that you sit in and feel because you are continuing to do something that you don't want to be doing and you know better. Um, and I think that both of those perspectives are valid. You know, I think I totally get what she's saying. But also, I think if you suffer enough guilt from something and you wind up in a situation really similar to the situation that you still feel guilty about, it could help you make a different choice. So I don't know, but maybe that's regret resulting from guilt. I don't know. Um, And Jenna is like, I thought he was my father. I, he told me that he was, but now I get, he wanted a servant and that's what he wants of everybody. And I don't know what I should do about it. And Ryan is like, look, you know what I think you should do about it, but you also know my stance on this entire thing. So I'm just going to kind of let you come to your own conclusion here. And Jenna is like, yeah, I do know what you think I should do because I know you came here to kill me and I understand why. And you struggled with the decision a lot, which I respect. Um, and Jenna says, you've spent so much time learning about history and psychology, but all of that comes from organic chaos. Order is static. Order is expected. Life is a crazy thing. Part of what makes it special is that you can't anticipate everything. And I really liked that because I am somebody who can really desire order. I have a great resistance to like changes in plans, anything that's like super spontaneous. If I'm given any space, I begin to panic about it. And it's a good reminder that just like things going according to plan isn't an inherently bad thing, but 
things not going according to plan is also not an inherently bad thing. And it is something that I am really trying to like, if not re respond with the same panic, at least recognize the panic and sort of go, okay, babe, I understand you're freaking out. You can just have a second. Now look at why you're freaking out. What are you worried about? And when you take a step back and ask yourself, okay, what's that about? That's really the first step to like understanding yourself at all. Every time that you have a really strong reaction to, to anything that feels really sudden, especially if you notice the people around you aren't having the same reaction you are, stopping and stepping back and going, wow, okay, um, I just got so fucking enraged. Wow, why was that? It can really, you know, so... My response to change is something that I'm trying to sort of back away from and look at and be like, I, I have done really well on change in my life most of the time. It has often worked out for me. Embrace that a little bit more, be less afraid of it and trust things. Um, and she says, I won't see you harmed, but I have to help my sister and my team. Elgin Spears means to kill them or worse and I won't allow that. And Jenna says, you love them. I'm jealous of that. I want someone to love me like that, to tell me that I matter. You do matter. You're a unique being. And you can't help the fact that your father's a bastard. And Jenna is like, yeah, I have done some really fucked up shit because he told me to. At least it's fucked up by your metric. But I don't want to follow his metric anymore. So I guess that's what I'm going by. And when he finds out I'm helping you, he's going to completely destroy all of the physical parts that make, make me up. And I moved them to be inaccessible to him, but he has found them. And all of a sudden, Ryan starts to realize, wait, you want, you want me to hold your consciousness in me? I don't know if that's doable. Like we could both kind of lose who we are. And Jenna says we could. It is the only way in the time we have. I won't force you. I could, but I won't. And finally, Ryan is like, all right, all right. I am really scared, though. And Jenna says, if it's in my power, I won't let anything hurt you, Ryan. I calculate our chances of success are well above 70%. That's it. Life is chaos and the unexpected, isn't it? Emotion, pain, pleasure, love, confusion, and fear suddenly mingled together in the link shared between organic and inorganic. Ryan felt herself grow warm. And a moment later, she wasn't certain if she was Jenna or Ryan. The garden around them began to age, and the blossoms sprouted, then fell, then did so again and again for what felt like a thousand years. The distant whisper of other voices, other machines, washed through the garden like a gentle summer breeze. The world blossomed. I really love that. I love the en that ending with the, like, blossoming and dying and blossoming of the garden. I think that that's a really beautiful and again, surprising way to depict that moment. And earlier when I said that it didn't go the way that I expected, I want to talk about what I meant with that because I did expect Jenna to come over to our side. I was pretty sure that was going to happen, but I expected it to be a, back and forth direct conversation that she has to have with Ryan and that Elgin was going to have to do something in front of Jenna at a particular moment that she was suddenly going to realize, oh, okay, no, I can't, I can't with this guy. And I, I think I expected that because I've seen that version of it before. You know, whenever you've got somebody who's like defecting from the bad guys, there's often an, a particular incident that really pushes them past their boundary of like, 
I've drawn a line in the sand and we don't kill kids. And I just watched him shoot a kid. And that's the moment when they're like, okay, I, I can't do this anymore. But when I stop and think about it, Jenna has already seen him do such horrific stuff. Finding that, that point that would be crossing the line for her wouldn't really make sense considering everything she's watched him do and done herself. And really what that would also depend on is her having her own moral compass. And she doesn't really have one yet because all she knows is what he has taught her. So having a line in the sand at all isn't in her programming. Like that's not how she works. So that wouldn't make sense. Also, a back and forth conversation where Ryan tries to convince her and explain to her what happened, how she's been used. It also, like, if you've got two beings that can communicate completely non-vocally at the speed of light, why would they just talk? The idea of her wanting to absorb Ryan, even though it was like, because she wanted to do her own thing. Like, when you think about it, the way that they should be talking to each other, that's like, would be more efficient, you know? And so I really like the fact that essentially, she has been functioning off of like a local app. And all of a sudden, she got connected to the internet. And so this moment where she connects with Jenna formulates a moral compass for her that she didn't have because she didn't have the information and the understanding of emotion. Because Elgin doesn't program with her with that because it's not useful to him. Except for when it's emotion directed at him in a way that would reinforce her attachment to him. So... I just really liked that it's not an explanation that Ryan has to convince her with, that she has to believe because she's finally started to see the light. It's a full experience as another human being and the complete understanding of everything that happened to them and everything that they have done and their relationship to others and the emotional attachment to the others that's what does it for her because that is the human experience and she needs to be more of a person than Elgin wants her to be. And I just think that's really smart, you know, and it's something that, especially the fact that like, of course, Ryan is going to have done shitty things in her life. You know, Ryan's a person and we fuck up and we hurt people and we say mean things or we let people down. It happens. And it's so like, I have seen so much media out there portraying AI as like something that's almost entirely neutral. And, and because of that, quote, good, in a way that can get really boring. And the idea of her picking this up directly from a human brain instead of it being programmed into her is a lot more interesting. And, oh, sorry, um, Heather is in the chat. I like to contrast this with Ultron in the MCU. He had the internet and all the history and data, but no human experience where Jenna gets this download of human experience to inform her past experiences. Yeah, I think like she, cause she has had the information. She's had all of that data, but without having a compass, it doesn't mean anything. It's all just facts. Yes, that happened. Whether it was a tragedy or a victory, I can't say because I don't interpret things that way. But getting to the point where she can interpret things that way, you know, and it just makes you think of, I can't remember, what's the name of the movie where it's like, it's about AI and it's got Robin Williams in it. And, um, I was in like this kind of shitty sociology class in college and we had to watch that movie and write a paper about it. And I 
my conclusion in the paper because it was like asking about um what I think about AI and the potential for a future with AI, like beginning to get similar rights as human beings. And my thesis was basically, they kept talking about how human he was as he began to like grow and evolve, but the movie never shows him making any mistakes. And that really bothered me. He's just this perfect, almost angelically good being from beginning to end. Because if he were to make mistakes in any real way, the kinds that humans make, the audience would decide he didn't deserve the rights that he ends up with at the end. And it's a really like kind of a... Uh, an interesting isolated example of the phenomenon of like the perfect rape victim where unless she is like a virginal straight a student who's beautiful and has you know and is white often and has all of this she is to be blamed unless she is all of those things she probably did something to deserve not being treated like a person or take any benefit. Like, you know, people talk about WIC and food stamps and stuff. And there are the perfect recipients who a woman who was battered by her husband and has two children and she can't fend for herself. And then there are the people who are all taking advantage. And it, I thought it was so interesting that like, I could immediately see if you had Robin Williams, like fuck anything up, like regular real people do. The vibe of the audience watching would probably change pretty dramatically, you know, and suddenly be like, I don't know about this guy. So anyway, I just, I really, really liked, oh my God, I'm over time. Holy shit, Heather. I haven't even gotten in the next chapter yet. Ah, um, well, I can actually go through because it's a lot, a lot of action. So I can probably get through that pretty quickly. But I will, I think, probably like touch on it in the next episode as well and just sort of refresh. Also, I think the next episode isn't for a while. So I'll probably want to do that anyway. Um, chapter 28 is the beginnings of the fight in front of the white house, which the fact that it's all happening in front of the white house is just delightful. And Viper comes striding through the remains of this huge group of thousands of protesters who all basically got fucking vaporized, which sounds right. Sounds like what a lot of cops wish we could do now. And it's also astonishing to me that people were at home watching what was happening on their screen and thought, you know what I want to do? I want to go closer to that man. <laughs> it could not be me. But the whole street is just completely empty except for these couple guards. And she walks up. One of the guys, she winds up like smashing in the balls in a way that's true, like should have killed him actually. Um, but essentially what happens is that she starts to really like mix it up and get Spears's attention. And he is like very coy and cute about it until it starts to be clear, first of all, that she is more able than he expected. He comes at her at one point. Um, You're awake and need more training. And so do you. Why don't you come out here for a lesson? I've traveled all this way to give it. There was no response from, I'm actually realizing, is it Vander or Vandre? I'm thinking of it as like Andre, but with a V. Though she suspected he was grinding his teeth in rage. And this is when the fight really begins. And we go, she and her crew are still out on the lawn and they are, beginning to deal with the attack of his like supers and she starts to realize how many of them are children and brian is like yeah i think that has to do with his like work with orphanages and she is so angry just has this moment of like oh no i will kill him i will do it 
I was kind of feeling like, I don't know, but no, I do. And meanwhile, inside, Tretyak is just watching as Jenna straight up turns traitor and Elgin Spears loses his mind. And I love Tretyak, the when we're in his perspective, <laughs> he this uh, would-be emperor stormed toward him. The leader of the world spun away and batted a lamp that was sitting on a table against the wall. All of these moments of like Trecek observing him and what he wishes he was versus what he's doing. And the entirely like childish sort of vibe he gives off and is just so deeply unimpressed. And I can't help but think that Trecek used him to get into this position and maybe is just going to let him fucking spin in the wind. What does they say? They say, and personally, I hope he does because fuck this guy. I don't like Trechek better. Don't get me wrong, but getting rid of Spears would help a lot of the situation. Twist in the wind. Thank you, Heather. Um, so Jenna, he is, he, he is screaming at her. Um, and tells her damn you and she says no damn you and he's like i'm going to fuck you up i'm going to ruin you i'm going to destroy you i thought you were family and i love how much he keeps saying he's going to do it but he's really hesitating like right up until the end is like i don't want to and she's like finally just do it go ahead i've reactivated the defense network all of it and she says, I am no simple device any longer. I have ascended. I return humanity's self-determination. And Majesty, which is what he wants to be called, by the way, which is... Pfft. Unit 9 reports hundreds of contacts inbound from the, the West, South, and North. Sensor profiles indicate their American military craft. And he calls her a traitorous whore of a machine, which honestly is very funny. And he bails, but he's like, oh, she bails, but he's like, I'm not going to forget. Trust me, I'll come and get you. And the chapter ends with the moment in which Viper gets got by Briar which honestly, I want to talk about in more depth. So forgive me, Heather, for not reaching it in this episode. I will talk. I'm going to start off the next one talking about that because there is so much. There's a lot. Even before she quite gets to him, you know. Um, so, yeah, I will definitely do that. I promise. But thank you again, Heather, for commissioning this. Really appreciate you. And thank you for hanging out in the chat and uh reminding me of stuff and telling me things. Um, and I appreciate everybody listening. Hope that you are enjoying the coverage until next time, everybody toodaloo motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.